I want to welcome you to the video and podcast ministry of Rosemark First Presbyterian Church in Rosemark, Tennessee. Let us begin our worship with a reading from Scripture. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then, when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. Come, let us worship Almighty God. Let us join together in our prayer of intercession. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, we know that you are a God of mercy and compassion, one whose steadfast love can transform all of us and give meaning to our lives. Therefore, as we pray together this day, we give you our adoration, thanksgiving, and praise. We are grateful for the perfection and omniscience of your divine wisdom. We are grateful for the patience and persistence of your divine love. We are grateful for the abundance and generosity of your divine providence. Grant this day that the eyes of all our hearts might be enlightened by the presence and power of the indwelling Jesus Christ. Help us in all things to seek and pursue your peace, to discern and honor your will, and to live for the praise of your glory. We are bold to pray again for all the victims of the coronavirus, COVID-19. Visit them with your healing mercies. Guide and bless all the medical personnel, the doctors, nurses, and hospital staff entrusted with their care. And restore them, restore those afflicted with the coronavirus to fullness and soundness of health. We are bold to pray again for all the scientists and researchers who work to discover medicine to treat and vaccines to prevent this terrible disease. Grant them heavenly guidance, heavenly wisdom, and heavenly insights. Especially do we pray this Sunday for the situation in Lebanon caused by the terrible fire and explosions in Beirut. We pray for the restoration of the hospital that was destroyed, the healing of the medical personnel who were wounded, and the care of the survivors who were desperately evacuated. All these things we ask in the strong and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to share with you today on the topic of God's training. And I want to begin by reading our two scripture readings, our two scripture lessons. First, in 1 Kings, verses 9 to 18 of chapter 19, we read the story of Elijah at Mount Horeb. At that place, he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, 
thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go return on the way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram, and you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of abel Mehola, as prophet in your place. Whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, Jehu shall kill. And whoever escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha shall kill. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Amen. Here ends our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures. To God be the glory and the praise. Next, I want to read our selection from the Gospel of Matthew, the 14th chapter, the 22nd to the 33rd verses. Listen again for the Word of God. Immediately he, meaning Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he, meaning Jesus, had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but by this time the boat, battered by the waves, was far from land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Amen. Here ends our reading from God's holy word. To God's name be the glory and the praise. 
I want to share with you today on the topic of God's training. God's training. And I'm brought to my topic by two verses in particular. First, the 13th verse of the 19th chapter of 1 Kings. And I quote, Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And secondly, the 31st verse of the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, you of little faith, why did you doubt God's training? But before I launch into my message, uh, my research team has been especially prolific uh, this week and, and come up with uh, some things for me to share with you. And these, again, are in the form of, of questions. What, what did the reporter say to the ice cream? What did he say? What's the scoop? <laughs> why, why does ice cream always get invited to the party? Well, the answer is, it's so cool. <laughs> what did the beach say to the tide when it washed in? Long time no see. <laughs> and finally, what does a mermaid, what does a mermaid, used to call her friends a shell phone, of course. <laughs> I hope that you continue to enjoy these as, as much as I do. One of my fathers in Christ, one of my mentors, when I was still a young man, once said to me, Horace, you know, people learn better on the edge of a smile than they do on the edge of a frown. So I thought that was pretty good. God's training. I will never forget the day in high school that I learned I was not cut out for the sport of cross-country running. After my father died, I was sent off to a boarding school, and students there were required to pick a sport. The school featured a beautiful campus way out in the country with rolling hills. In a moment of madness, I know that now, I did not realize that then, in a moment of madness, I decided it would be fun to run cross country. I would be outside in the beautiful world of nature. I would get healthy and enjoy wholesome exercise. I would thus be able to even to keep my waistline under control. I understood that I would have a period of training. I boldly, or perhaps stupidly, pledged to the coach that I would not, as he requested, that I would not drop out before the end of the first week. I got pep talks and encouragement from the coaches. The last day of the week, we were told we would have a special run. I fidgeted nervously, waiting to see what exactly constituted a special run. I discovered it was uphill for the first half, and we would have to climb or leap over wooden fences, and we were cautioned not to step in cow patties. Now, for those of you who don't know what a cow patty is, I will let you look it up. Suffice it to say, you very much do not want to step in one. Suffice it to add, you very much do not want to track the results into the living quarters of someone you care about. I have intense memories of climbing over wooden fences while my lungs 
felt like they were bursting. I have intense memories of leaping over or jumping around cow patties. I have intense memories of thinking the downhill half of the race would be easier and discovering instead that it strained a whole new set of muscles. I desperately needed that training and perhaps even the experience of failure to discover what was and what was not my particular athletic gift. I was not the only runner who ended up on my knees, gasping for airs, gasping for air, and doing the dry heaves. Though I intended to bounce in the, uh, though I tended to bounce in the saddle, my horseback riding instructress at least was sweet enough to say that I looked very elegant in the way I fell. On the positive side, the horse seemed completely indifferent to planting a hoof in a cow patty. Later, training to, play, training to play soccer was hard work, but not nearly as hard as cross country. Not to run or gallop across the countryside on either foot or horseback, to be sure, but nonetheless, God's servant, and by that I mean what the great North African father of the church insisted, his name was Tertullian, insisted each and every one of us need, I would even say desperately need, God's training. We need God's training in order to serve God with true excellence. We need God's training in order to serve God with maximum effectiveness. We need God's training in order to serve God with spiritual integrity. More than a cross-country racer, racer huffing and puffing up a hill, and more than a horseback rider hanging on for dear life, we need God's training. The Apostle Paul once wrote, Athletes, athletes exercise self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. But we, meaning Christians, we an imperishable one. Elijah needed God's training to be the prophet God wanted him to be. After slaying the 450 prophets of Baal, Elijah fled from the pagan queen Jezebel who threatened to kill him in revenge. Having arrived in the wilderness, he gave in to despair and prayed for death. Nourished by bread and water provided by God's angel, Elijah traveled 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. Please remember that Mount Horeb in the Bible is another name for Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where God appeared to Moses. Mount Sinai is where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, not once but twice. Mount Sinai is where God ratified the covenant with the chosen people. So Mount Sinai, or Mount Horeb, is a place of divine revelation. It is a place of divine instruction. It is a place to establish a divine relationship it is a place for Moses of successful prayer and intercession on behalf of the chosen people with Almighty God. On the basis of what Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb meant to Moses and the chosen people, it is not too much to say that Mount Horeb was a place for God's training. Given the lengthy pilgrimage that lay ahead, it is hardly surprising that the angel of the Lord awakened the sleeping prophet in order to fortify his physical body for the arduous spiritual journey God had planned. We read that God's training began as a personal and questioning word of the Lord for Elijah. What are you doing here, Elijah? 
Elijah then rehearsed before his creator what he, Elijah, thought was the main reason for his long journey. I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. How many times have we tried to discern God's will for us as the solution to our personal confusion and fears? How many times have we forsaken being positive and proactive men and women of faith because we are consumed by doubt and anxiety over the past? How many times have we let self-pity and the fear of evil divert and distract us from the wonderful blessings God wants to share in and through us? As it did for Elijah, God's training often has to begin with an honest self-assessment and a realistic self-appraisal. This can be both painful and frightening, but this also requires our cooperation and wholehearted participation. How must Elijah have felt when he heard the great wind splitting mountains and breaking rocks? How must Elijah have felt when he realized the very earth beneath his feet was being shaken by an earthquake? How must Elijah have felt when he felt the heat and smelled the smoke of a great fire? How must Elijah have felt when he heard the sound of sheer silence? I believe Almighty God was teaching him and training him in a dramatic way that the absence of God's word, the pain of God's silence, was more powerful than the most destructive forces of nature. I believe God was teaching and training Elijah that his prophetic ministry was crucial for a lasting and viable peace. So we hear Yahweh God repeat his earlier question once more. What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah repeats the, the same initial answer. Only now he puts his retelling of events in a different context. Only now he knows that God is ready to work in and through him with a power greater than any other. Only now he understands that God will work through him to anoint kings and to anoint a prophet. God's training has equipped Elijah with appropriate humility, divinely inspired wisdom, and divinely based confidence. In order to come to grips with the biblical account of Jesus walking on the water, uh, which is contained in our New Testament reading this morning, we have to examine the biblical context. The passages immediately before and immediately after our New Testament reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Prior to the scripture we looked at last week, the account of the miracle of feeding the 5,000, we took note of the execution of John the Baptist, a relative near and dear to the heart of Jesus Christ. Jesus had originally gone to that mountainous region to rest and to mourn for John's execution. Just after that passage, we have a second miraculous account this time of Jesus both walking on water and summoning Peter to join him standing on top of the water. Again, this is miraculous. Once again, the disciples seem to have doubted Jesus, just as they had when they questioned how they could ever feed so many 
with a small amount of food they had at hand. Only now they panic and mistake Jesus for a ghost. Even Peter, who asked Jesus to be allowed to walk to him across the surface of the water, paled and started to sink when he saw the ferocity of the wind and the waves. At least one commentator, however, has interpreted the fact that Jesus could catch and lift the sinking Peter with one hand by saying that Peter must have made it almost all the way to his Lord before he needed more help. So here was God's training at work. Jesus allowed Peter to try and even begin to fail so as to inspire him to go beyond his current limits. The second miraculous account ended with a crucial verse. Matthew the evangelist recorded, and I quote, and those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. That is in Matthew 14, 33. According to one commentator, this was the first time the disciples addressed Jesus with his full title. Peter would later do so in answer to Jesus' question, but who do you say, do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's in Matthew 16, 15 and following. Similarly, Matthew reported about Jesus' death on the cross. The evangelist wrote about that later event when the centurion and those who were with him, who were keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place. They were terrified and said, truly, this man was the son of God. But here, for the first time, God's training helped Peter and the other disciples to recognize his true identity, the crucial basis of their faith and their ministry. Amen. To God be the glory and the praise.